On the African pepper coast, you can find a country covered in tropical rainforest and populated by many tribal people, all with very different origins and cultures. Some indigenous, like the Kru, Basa, Kisi and Gola people, while others, like the Capelle, Chio and Mano people, actually having migrated there from the medieval Mali Empire. But to comprehend the story of Liberia, this is not the part of the world you want to focus on first. Its story actually starts much further to the west, in the United States of America, that's arguing over slavery. One misconception about the abolitionist movement in the United States is that most opponents of slavery were in favor of a multi-ethnic society. Most actually did not believe that black Americans would be able to integrate into American society, and thus many supported the creation of a colony for free slaves in Africa. One prominent proponent of this plan was the black American Paul Cuffe from Massachusetts. He was in favor of black Americans returning to their African homeland, which might sound odd considering most had been slaves in the Americas for generations at that point, but that's how he described it. He actually gained support from the British and in 1816 was able to send 38 black Americans to Freetown, the current capital of Sierra Leone. You probably also understand where that city's name comes from now. He did die shortly after though, and was not able to undertake any more projects. He had planted a seed though, the seed that would inspire and result in the creation of the American Colonization Society, or ACS for short. This organization would be sending ships to the West African coast from 1820 and onwards. These ships would include mostly free blacks from America, as well as a small number of white supervisors. The settlement started initially at Cape Mesorado, next to the current day's capital, Moravia. But the colony would greatly expand along the coast as well as further inland as more freed blacks arrived. Besides this, the Pepper Coast would also see the creation of more other American colonies created by different American states. But if you thought these early days of Liberian history went smoothly, you could not be more wrong. The settlers were plagued by a climate they were not used to after generations in the United States, as well as disease and frequent attacks from neighboring non-Christian tribes. A clear distinction had begun to exist since the first day the settlers arrived. The so-called Americo-Liberians, which is how they were called after the creation of a unified Liberian colony in 1838, were clearly distinct from the tribal people of the Pepper Coast, being from families that had been in the United States for centuries in some instances, being Christian, and often also of mixed race origin, made them very different to the largely uncivilized tribes they acquired the land from. The number of black settlers that arrived in Liberia from the first ship in 1820 up to 1843, a little after the unification of the Liberian colonies, was 4,571. Of these, only 1,819 had survived up until the latter date. The Liberian colony actually made somewhat of a name for itself, for being the country with the highest mortality rate in the world, counting only the settler population, that is of course. Despite the high risk of emigrating, the ACS did not stop transporting black settlers from the United States to Liberia. The most common argument was that the harsh conditions were simply God testing the strength of the settlers, filtering out the weak ones. A more important reason though was probably the financial dependence of many people on the organization. Who in their right mind would admit that emigrating to Liberia was too dangerous if their own livelihood depended on the industry of transporting people there? The ACS, like any other organization, had a financial motive too. But this did not save them from going effectively bankrupt during the further course of the 1840s. In 1847, on demand from the ACS itself, the Commonwealth of Liberia declared its independence as the Republic of Liberia, with the first black governor of the Commonwealth becoming the first president of this new republic, Joseph Jenkins Roberts. This new republic came up with a political system and a constitution modeled after the United States, and even its political parties had similar sounding names, like the Republican Party or the True Whig Party. Its money became known as the Liberian Dollar, and to this day they are still one of the few countries who also use the imperial system of measurement, rather than the metric. 
it's clearly an American colony. The Republic of Liberia was also predominantly dominated by the small Americo-Liberian minority, both politically and culturally. There was a clear cultural caste system with Americo-Liberians being considered superior to the tribal people of the land. I'm explicitly stating this was a cultural caste system though, as the Liberians made it clear that they believed in racial equality. They believed that the tribal people of the land could become equal to them by converting to Protestant Christianity and following Western education. This did not prevent the New Republic from experiencing any conflict however. There were still many rebellions during its early history and even a border dispute with the British and French after Liberia had incorporated the territories of the Garebo and Kru people into their colony. Liberia never really had to fear any serious threat to their existence though, as they could always count on military support from their older brother, the United States. The Liberian economy in these early days was entirely agricultural. More specifically, they had a massive coffee industry, competing with the many European colonies in Africa. Their successes in this industry were only temporary though. As towards the end of the 19th century, the country was overtaken by competitors in many aspects. Their coffee industry saw huge losses as Brazil became the new world leader in coffee cultivation. The modernization of European colonies gave these a huge technological and infrastructural advantage over Liberia. And to make things even worse, the Liberian dollar also collapsed in 1907. As things started to look slightly better again during the early 20th century, with Liberia becoming one of the world's biggest exporters of iron ore and the world's largest exporter of rubber, a new social challenge faced the country. Since it had existed, Liberia had a clear divide between the Americo-Liberian coastal regions and the indigenous inland. This clear divide came under pressure as more indigenous people showed a desire to move to the coast because of job opportunities. For the longest time, the government would try to suppress this, but from World War II and onwards, they would no longer be able to keep people from seeking opportunities near the coast. From this point onwards, the supremacy of the Americo-Liberian minority became smaller and smaller. In 1979, protests broke out over the rising prices of rice. The then president, William R. Tolbert Jr., ordered the army to shoot the protesters, resulting in the death of 70 people. This resulted in massive riots in the country and eventually in a coup d'etat in 1980. President Tolbert was killed and replaced by Samuel Doe, a member of the indigenous Kram people. This would mark the end of americo liberian rule over the country. Since then, the country has sort of drifted away from being America's little brother, starting to look more and more like a typical African country. In the 1990s and early 2000s, two civil wars took place, and in 2014 the country made international news because of the Ebola epidemic. Yet, the country still has a political system strongly resembling the United States's, uses the imperial system of measurement, speaks English, and then there's the flag. Now, not the county flags. As you've probably noticed from the subject, the intro, and maybe even because you came here from This Is Barrett's video on French Algeria, this video is a part of a big collaboration between several history YouTubers. If you want to watch more, I'll highly recommend the next video in line by House of History about the Nile Conquest.